Well, hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's good to be with you on this Friday, September 2nd, and here's some of what we're talking about tonight. The latest revelation from the Mar-a-Lago search, dozens of empty folders that apparently once held classified material. We'll dig into where those documents might be and how this fits into the investigation. President Biden is getting even stronger blowback from some Trump supporters after he accused them of threatening American democracy. MAGA Republicans do not respect the Constitution. They do not believe in the rule of law. They do not recognize the will of the people. Political analyst Jonathan Alter joins us to discuss the reactions to last night's presidential address. Plus, one of Latin America's best-known politicians survived an apparent assassination attempt. What do we know so far about this frightening moment? And more people are returning to the office after this Labor Day weekend, maybe you too. We'll see how Apple thinks it should be done and why some employees think different. Last night, we saw President Biden take aim at former President Trump and his followers. During his speech in Philadelphia, he called them a threat to American democracy. Much of what's happening in our country today is not normal. Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. Not every Republican, not even the majority of Republicans are MAGA Republicans. Not every Republican embraces their extreme ideology. But there's no question that the Republican Party today is dominated, driven, and intimidated by Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans. Some of Mr. Trump's most prominent supporters have clapped back at those accusations. Among them, House, House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy, party chairwoman Ronna McDaniel, and Congresswomen Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene. They say, among other things, that the speech disparaged millions of Americans, that it was divisive, and it painted Republicans as, quote, enemies of the state. Mr. Trump reacted on his social media platform. He posted that President Biden should not be representing the United States if he does not want to make America great again. Let's dig into this with MSNBC political analyst Jonathan Alter. He has a new article about this called Biden at the Barricades on his Substack, Old Goats with Jonathan Alter. We'll talk about the title of your Substack some other time. I positively <laughs> love the title. But let me get into the sentiments within your article and, frankly, just the impact of the speech. I'm not sure, and maybe you have a different sense of it than I do, but I'm not sure how much the speech moved the needle or said anything unexpected or revelatory. So what difference did it make? What is the net effect of that speech? Um, so it didn't move the needle because it was not meant to be a persuasion speech. It was meant to be a mobilization speech. So he was not speaking to MAGA Republicans, except to frame them uh, as being opposed uh, to the rule of law, the peaceful transfer of power, um, and you know respect for um, legitimate election returns, which is all accurate. Uh, he was not accusing MAGA Republicans of doing anything they haven't done. In fact, on the very day, Joshua, that he gave this speech, former President Trump said that if reelected, he would pardon the January 6th insurrectionists. Think about that for a second. Pardon the people who attacked the Capitol Police and committed a lot of violence. So um, that tells you how extreme that, that um, segment of uh, the Republican Party has become. And I thought uh, Biden was careful to say he wasn't talking about all Republicans, but just what he calls MAGA Republicans. And that phrase, by the way, I think will be the most lasting uh, legacy of this speech. It will enter the American political lexicon and you'll hear it for decades to come. The invocation of that phrase and the president's speech, not surprisingly, as we mentioned, did not sit well with some of the most prominent Republicans in the party. Let's listen to how a few more of them responded to the president's address. Listen. President Biden has chosen to divide, demean, and disparage his fellow Americans. He sounds, that sounds like a long-winded description 
uh, uh, and, and definition of what Secretary Clinton called deplorables. I don't think any of the responses to this, as you mentioned, are a surprise. And this wasn't necessarily a, you know, this wasn't a needle moving speech. This was more of a galvanizing speech. But how does this fit in at a time when Democrats are concerned about keeping the House and the Senate if they can? The president is trying to keep getting his agenda moving forward. I mean, whether or not a majority of Republicans still are allegiant to President Trump, President Biden's got an agenda to try and advance. So how does this fit into just the day-to-day -day work of governance? So um, it, it's, it, I, I find it rich, I guess, when you hear somebody like Kevin McCarthy say that Biden is divisive and demeaning. Um, this is what the psychologists call projection. You know, Donald Trump wrote the book on being divisive and demeaning. So I, I don't think that criticism holds a lot of water. As far as um, the midterms go, I think this uh, provided a, a, a way of framing the midterms and keeping Trump in the picture and putting democracy on the ballot, putting Trump on the ballot, even though he's not, sets the stakes in a different way. It makes the midterms about something more than high gas prices or even abortion. It's about whether you want to turn over the keys of the car to people who believe um, if they don't win the election, the other side's cheating. You know, so you have a number of Republicans in key states who are campaigning on um, the idea that, you know, uh, Joe Biden is not the legitimate president. And that's a very, very extreme position. The more that extreme position is out front, Joshua, this fall, the better the Democrats do. So this speech was uh, a shot in the arm for Democrats. And I just want to clarify, we heard from uh, Kevin McCarthy there. That was actually a pre to the speech. Right. That was not a response. That was a pre right. to the speech in Scranton, Pennsylvania. That was a few hours before the president spoke. One other piece of this is the optics of all of this. I don't want to get too deep into the Internet rabbit hole that has created the dark Brandon meme about Joe Biden kind of finding his, you know, big, powerful, good guy motif with, like, the red glowing eyes and Google it if you don't know what I'm talking about. It's out there. But one of the bits of imagery from last night that has gotten some critique is the use of United States Marines stationed on the left and the right of the door at Independence Hall from which the president entered, and they were in the backdrop during the speech. I wonder how careful you think the president needs to be in terms of making remarks about things that millions of Americans no doubt agree with him on, but because he's trying to take the high road, perhaps the standard is higher than it would be otherwise, and even details like this, I mean, granted, the, the presence of a United States Marine is never just a detail. I don't mean to minimize them. But that it raises the stakes in terms of not just what the president says, but how he says it. Well, I think it's a good question. And, um, you know, I objected when President Trump used the White House as a setting for campaign events, which had never really been done before in, in our history. And I think, so by the same token, I, I don't think it was a great idea for him to use the Marines. Uh, you, you don't want that kind of imagery in something that is, in, in many ways, a, you know, quite political speech. But I have to say, you know, the color guard comes in, for instance, at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, and the, the Marines appear uh, on many occasions where the president is there and often giving a hard-hitting political speech. So, you know, I would imagine that most of the people who are being critical of that didn't have a word to say uh, when Donald Trump was using all of the trappings uh, of power uh, as a backdrop for his even more explicit campaign events in 2000. 20, but I think you're right that uh, the standard is higher for Biden, and he accepts that. It was interesting. The other, I think, fascinating thing that happened was, you mentioned Brandon. There was a heckler who was using a megaphone yeah. with Brandon insults, and Biden handled that beautifully. And it really, it really illustrated the theme of his speech. He said, this is democracy. The guy, we have the right to say outrageous things. He, he incorporated the heckler into his message, and that was a real contrast to, you know, what Trump did when he would be heckled and he'd say, you know, punch him. Uh, I'm fine if you send him to the hospital, I'll pay your legal bills. 
the kind of thing that Trump used to say. So that's part of that contrast between pro-democracy uh, Americans in both parties and MAGA Republicans who don't believe in the rule of law. MSNBC political analyst Jonathan Alter, appreciate you coming on tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joshua. Americans are traveling in big numbers this Labor Day weekend. Maybe you too. Safe travels if you are. AAA expects about a third of the country to hit the road. And I do mean road. More than 80% say they will drive this weekend. But what can we expect at the airports, especially after a very challenging summer? NBC's Ellison Barber has more from New York's JFK International Airport. If you've flown anywhere this summer, there is a good chance you or someone close to you has experienced delays or even cancellations. And not necessarily because of things you expect might delay or cancel flights like weather, but because of other things like staffing shortages or air maintenance issues. All of it has frustrated travelers. And in part because of that, the Department of Transportation has launched a new online dashboard to try and make it easier for airline customers to see whether or not their flights are delayed or canceled. And also also to see whether or not they're eligible for any sort of compensation. This dashboard, it's called the Airline Customer Service Dashboard. And basically what people can do is get online, see whether or not their flight has been canceled or delayed. And if it was canceled or delayed because of issues that are within the airline's control, like staffing shortages or maintenance issues, they can figure out more easily whether or not they are eligible for some sort of compensation. Travelers here heading home or away for the holiday weekend are hoping they don't have to use that website. Listen. Yeah, I think it's helpful, actually, because, um, you know, they, they cancel flights, yeah, but uh, and I, my, my flight was had a chance of being canceled. Of course, it was delayed an hour. I mean, it's good for if you're flying out and you want information as far as your flight is concerned. You can always have some update on issues like that. More than 12.7 million people are expected to depart U.S. airports this long holiday weekend. That is according to the travel website Hopper. And the three busiest airports will be Atlanta, Los Angeles, and Denver. Back to you. Thank you, Ellison. That's NBC's Ellison Barber reporting from JFK Airport. Well, depending on where you are headed, it could get dangerously hot. Nearly 40 million Americans are already under excessive heat warnings. This week brought record highs from California to Montana, and forecasters warn that this may be one of the region's worst September heat waves on record. Let's get your Labor Day weekend forecast with NBC meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Hey, Michelle. Hey there, Joshua. Always good to see you. And yeah, we're going to break more records. We're going to definitely break daily records, most likely dating, uh, uh, breaking monthly records and possibly breaking all time records. So 48 million Americans out west under some sort of heat alert, whether it's an excessive heat warning or a heat advisory. And that's what we're going to see over the next four or five days. So it's not just the intensity of the heat. It's the duration of this heat wave. You combine these and that's where it gets particularly dangerous. So 48 million Americans impacted. We're looking at temperatures into the triple digits. It's all due to this area of high pressure. It's stuck in place. It's a heat dome. It's anchored over the four corners and it's quite literally acting like a heat pump, pumping in this hot air, closing off any cool air from Canada. And we're going to see it stuck in place. That's sort of that climate connection where we get that traffic jam in the atmosphere. It's not budging left or right. It's not moving out quickly. And that's why we're stuck in these weather extreme events and we're stuck for a duration. So we're going to see daily records for sure fall as we go throughout the next couple of days. And we could see 50 cities uh, impacted as well as 10 states in terms of any records falling over the next several days, especially throughout this weekend. But it's going to last Monday into Tuesday. For the rest of the day, we're looking at temperatures into the 100s, most likely reaching their high right about now. now. And then as we go throughout tomorrow, we're going to see temperatures into the 100s once again. Sacramento, not used to this. We're looking at 102 on Saturday, 105 on Sunday, 109 on Monday. Burbank, same story. You're going to be near 110. Death Valley, 125. That's what you're forecasted for on Saturday. If you reach a high of 126, that will be the hottest temperature ever recorded on Earth in the month of September. So really noteworthy. Salt Lake City this weekend, 102 on Saturday. Same story on Sunday. Not much relief on Monday, right around a 101. And we're looking at temperatures near 110. 
in portions of Arizona as well. Now, this is going to increase the risk for heat illnesses, especially along, among the elderly, the young, also the immune compromised. But we're also looking at fire danger increasing. Now, remember, it's Labor Day. We all want to be outside grilling, possibly spending a lot of times outdoors. But we're looking at really dry brush, hot, dry, and breezy conditions, Joshua. So we do have a red flag warning in much of the West. Back to you. And I do want to note in uh, one of the areas that we're watching, Michelle, that we are keeping an eye on a fire that's burning in the town of Weed, which is in Siskiyou County, which is northern California. Authorities are telling our station in Sacramento that it is forcing immediate evacuations today, and the mill fire has burned more than 900 acres. So we're keeping an eye on some of the areas that are in red right behind Michelle for increased fire danger this weekend. That's NBC meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Thank you, Michelle. Still to come, we'll have the latest on the Mar-a-Lago search. It turned up more than 10,000 items, including a lot of classified documents. We'll have the latest on the investigation and the legal fight. Then, how likely is another Donald Trump presidential campaign? Jared Kushner answered that question and more in an exclusive interview. We're glad you're with us on this Friday before you head out for vacation. For now, tonight, from NBC News. What did the FBI take from Mar-a-Lago in last month's search? A federal judge unsealed a list of items today. Agents took more than 10,000 government documents, including some with classified markings. According to the latest court filing, the Justice Department also says the search uncovered more than 40 empty folders. They were marked as containing classified material. It's unclear if there were documents inside, and if so, what happened to them? Former Attorney General Bill Barr reacted to this today on Fox News. He said there was no legitimate reason for classified documents to be at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, I think the driver on this from the beginning was, the, it was you know, loads of classified information sitting in Mar-a-Lago. People say this was unprecedented. Well, it's also unprecedented for a president to take all this classified information and put them in a country club, okay? And how, how long is the government going to uh, try to get that back? You know, they jawbone for a year. They were deceived on the voluntary uh, actions taken. Uh, they then went and got a subpoena. They were deceived on that. Uh, they feel, and the record, the facts are starting to show that they were being jerked around. And, and so how long, you know, how long do they wait? NBC Justice reporter Ryan Riley joins us now from our Washington bureau. Ryan, 10,000 documents, more than 100 marked with various kinds of classifications. Where does this put us overall in terms of what we know about what was seized at Mar-a-Lago? It's pretty damning uh, for the former president just because all of these records, regardless of their classification status, shouldn't have been held by the former president. They properly belong uh, with the National Archives. They're supposed to be held by the U.S. government because they're U.S. government records. That uh, goes back to a law, the Presidential Records Act, that was established following Richard Nixon. So there's a reason that we have that in place and those records are supposed to be held there. But additionally, in terms of the top secret documents, this is especially compelling because we know the location of a lot of these documents now and what they were mixed in and in intermingled with. Um, you know, there was a thousand government records in Donald Trump's office, uh, that, and then 10,000 more um, in his storage unit. But then if you d drill that down even further, you have all these classified documents that were held in the office where Donald Trump was doing a lot of business. And that's where the passport comes into play, the passports that were seized that Donald Trump complained about, because um, they were held in the same drawer as a lot of these classified documents. So that's pretty convincing evidence if you were to take that in front of the uh, jury uh, that the former president was handling those documents themselves because of course you know if you have your passport stored somewhere that's somewhere you're you're keeping important documents and keep and keeping uh, things that you deal with on a regular basis it's very unlikely that an aide was in his, his desk drawer uh, dealing with his passports directly so it's pretty overall I think a pretty damning picture for the former president Joshua and just to be clear, Ryan, these are passports that were seized and then returned afterward, right? He's gotten those back. He has gotten those back, yes, but they are part of this evidence. I think they would be uh, used if this would ever end up in court, where the location of his passports is part of the government's evidence here for sure. 
Do we know anything more about what was in those documents? I mean, there were also those folders that were empty, where there are presumably either documents that were shuffled around among whatever was seized. Maybe they were just taken out of the folders and put in other stacks. Hopefully, they're not just gone. But do we know anything more about the contents of those documents, or is that still under wraps? Yeah, I mean, all of these docu documents are, are classified, and that's one of the difficult things that I think if this were to eventually get to Merrick, Garland, uh, Merrick Garland's desk for a decision on whether or not uh, to bring this case forward, that's something that I think prosecutors are going to have to weigh here because if you were to bring this to trial, it makes it a little bit more complicated in terms of identifying what the documents were if they're under wraps. Now, there is a law that makes it easier to bring these uh, things to trial and disclose some uh, aspects of it. There is something set up for to, to essentially solve that problem of not being able to put on the public docket, say, what these classified documents were. But it still is a complicating factor in this matter. I don't think we're going to learn too much beyond those, those classification levels, what the actual underlying documents were here. But the folder question is a little bit, a little bit up in the air. I'm not sure how, how much we can read into that uh, based on this new filing alone, because you know we're not sure if they pair directly with any of the actual classified documents. It, it seems that they were empty, but you know, we don't know if they were shuffled, if there was some of those classified documents are, are paired in some nature, if he you know, took them out of the folder and stacked them on top, we really don't know. But overall, we got a sense that this was a pretty chaotic uh, documents uh, situation in Donald Trump's office and in his, uh, his storage facility in, in Mar-a-Lago, Joshua. And before I let you go, how is the former president's legal team responding to this or pushing back against these latest revelations? Yeah, I mean, they, they haven't really responded directly to very specific allegations. Broadly, they've said essentially that um, this is, uh, that that you would expect government presidential records to be uh, held by the former president, but they're just sort of ignoring, I think, the broader issue that he wasn't supposed to hold on to any of these records. They're trying to make this up to be just sort of a, bureauc a bureaucratic dispute between the National Archives uh, and the president and saying that this was a matter of ongoing negotiations, but he really stonewalled them for a very long time here based on the record that we've seen reflected in a lot of these court filings and you know I think that this wasn't something that Merrick Garland was necessarily gunning for but the evidence just kept pointing in that direction that they were being misled by the president about those classified documents so especially whoever signed that that paperwork that said we've looked through uh, all of the, uh, the, these documents we've turned over all of the classified ones when that happened back in early June uh, I think they're going to be on the hook here and, and should definitely be lawyering up themselves because that's going to be a, uh, certainly something that could result in charges going down the line, Joshua. All right, thank you, Ryan. That's NBC Justice reporter Ryan Riley with the latest on the document search from our Washington Bureau. Meanwhile, the various January 6th investigations had some big developments today. Former White House counsel Pat Cipollone appeared before a federal grand jury. It's part of the investigation led by the Department of Justice. To our knowledge, he's the highest-ranking Trump administration official to appear before this grand jury. President Trump's deputy counsel, Pat Philbin, also testified today. Both men spoke with jurors and prosecutors behind closed doors for about four hours. Back in June, Mr. Trump's son-in-law and former senior advisor, Jared Kushner, spoke to the January 6th committee. Today, he gave an exclusive interview to our partners at Sky News. Sky's Kay Burley began by asking what Mr. Kushner thought of the 2020 election. President Biden is, is the president right now, so uh, there was a transfer of power. Um, I think it was a very sloppy election. I think it's caused a lot of people in our country to look at how our elections are conducted. You know, during COVID, uh, they changed a lot of the rules, which gave a lot of people uh, a lot of concerns with how our elections are conducted. But the hope is, is that, you know, in, in the next elections, which are coming up, you know, we'll have much uh, cleaner elections and, and it'll give people a lot more confidence in terms of uh, in terms of what the outcome is. Yeah, but some still say it was stolen by the Democrats. What do you think? Uh, I think they changed a lot of rules at the last minute, used COVID as a pretense to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to fight the election. So you think it was stolen? I think it was a very sloppy election in terms of how it was conducted. And I think that Joe Biden's the president. I think that's been a disaster for our country and for the world. How comfortable were you being in the presence of the de facto leader of Saudi Arabia? Uh, very comfortable. Some people have issues about the murder of Jamal Khashoggi and his involvement in that. Did that play on your mind at all? 
uh, that was obviously a significant uh, consideration. I, I write about it in the book. It was a, it was an episode, but there were. Did a you lot ever of, bring it up with him? Yeah, I write about the interactions we had on it. But look, my, our, our job was to represent America's interests in the region. Yeah, to that end, do you think MBS could expect support from any future Trump administration? I think it will always be based on the policies. I think the media always tries Is that to. A yes, perhaps. No, I think it's going to be policy by policy considered. You know, the media always tries to say you're in one camp or another, and what I try to show in the book is that we were incredibly nuanced in the we're policies. We're not always the bad guys, you know. No, I, again, I, I, sometimes you deserve it and sometimes maybe not. But, but w what I find is that if you go through the Trump administration, and, and again, I think that you'll see there was a lot of very rational policies that were pursued. And I think that that gets lost sometimes in the hyperventilation or the, uh, or the sensationalism of the media. The 6th of January, it was very much a date in history. What were your recollection of events on that day? So I was on a plane back that day. Again, uh, I think that nobody in the White House thought there would be uh, violence as far as I was uh, aware. And uh, obviously what happened was, was terrible, seeing people storm. I got back. Um, I obviously you know, ended up getting to the White House after a statement I put out. And then after that, we worked uh, continuously to try to make sure there was a peaceful transfer of power. How concerned were you, given that you were such a, you know, a high profile member of the team, how concerned were you about the safety of uh, Vice President Pence? Uh, like I said at the time, I wasn't aware of the details of what was going on, but I was concerned for the safety of everybody, obviously. Okay, it's just, again, um, I actually was also uh, not working at the time, but apparently there was uh, some suggestions that his, his, at some point his life was, was in danger. That's not something that, that you were aware of. Uh, look, I, I think the Secret Service does a tremendous job. I have a lot of confidence. They you know, protected him, they protected the president, they protected our family and a lot of our officials for... Uh, many years. I, I don't know how close or, or how not close it, it, it came that day. Uh, but like I said, ultimately uh, they restored uh, peace there. Uh, I'll tell you, over five years uh, there was over 600 Trump rallies. We never had any violence, never had any problems. What did you say to the president? Uh, I saw him after it was done. So. Okay, so you didn't see him at all that day? Uh, I saw him after it was done. He'd gone up. You didn't tell him that you had thyroid cancer, did you? Why not? Uh, I didn't, I ultimately did tell him, but I didn't want to burden him. He had so many things on his mind. Again, I, I, it's hard to imagine what it's like being the leader of the free world, but there's just a lot on your shoulders. I write a funny scene in the book where before I'm about to disappear for a couple of days to get it, uh, the surgery done, I get called to the Oval Office. He closed the door, which he never did. He was always a very you know, open uh, president. And he says, you know, are you nervous about the surgery? And I said, well, uh, how do you know about that? And he says, well, I'm the president. I know everything. <laughs> so I, I later found out, I think one of the White House docs had told him. And uh, he says, you know, don't worry about it. We got your back here. And have you been poorly again recently? You've had further surgery. Yes. I, I recently went for a checkup. They found something that required another surgery. I went and did it. And uh, thankfully, that was uh, successful as well. I want to talk about Mary Lago quickly, if I may. Um, peace shattered there. Very tranquil place for the family. Uh, peace shattered by an FBI raid. Why did the president take home toxic, top secret documents? Uh, you have to ask him uh, that question, but you know what I will say is if, if you look at my book, you'll see that he was under constant attack. Yeah, but he took top, top secret documents home, potentially risking the security of the United States. Yeah, I think that it's something that, again, this seems like it's an issue of paperwork that should have been able to be worked out between DOJ and him. I don't know what he took or what he didn't take, but I think right now we're relying on leaks to the media, which is the same thing We've that we... We've seen the photograph, haven't we, where it says top secret. Yeah, like I said, I, 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 I've seen a lot of allegations made by the media over my four years that turned out not to be true. So uh, I think that this whole thing is actually elevated. So the fact that we've seen photographs that say top secret document, we should wait and see whether or not they were, even though we're being told by the FBI. I mean, first of all, he was the President of the United States. He had the highest clearance in the world. So I, I don't know if there, it, look, this may be a paperwork issue. This may be, I, I, I don't know. Like I said, I haven't been involved in the details of it. OK, talk to me about 2024. Have you spoken to him about it? Uh, he's asked me about it. I, I said, it, you know, it's tricky. What did he uh, ask you? Uh, I'd rather not go into that. But, but basically, I know that he's, um, he's obviously thinking about it. He hates seeing what's happening in the country. You know, he had the economy running so well. He filled the hole economically that was caused by COVID. He got us out of it with the vaccine. But um, when will he decide? When will he have to decide? We're heading towards the midterms, aren't we? So he's going to have to decide soon. Uh, when he's ready. I, 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 like I he's said. He's not ruling it out, though, is he? I'm sorry? He's not ruling it out. Uh, like I said, with Trump, it's hard to rule anything out. So he's, uh, he's a very uh, flexible thinker. He's definitely going to run, isn't he? 
uh, like I said, with him, you never know. So it's, uh, he keeps it interesting all the time. Jerry Kushner, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. That was Sky News presenter Kay Burley reporting. We'll get to some of today's other top stories in just a moment, including inspectors finally reaching Ukraine's largest nuclear power plant, a terrifying moment in Argentina, what looks like an assassination attempt, and a big announcement from Jane Fonda about her health. Tonight's headlines begin in Ukraine. Inspectors are learning more about the potential danger at Europe's largest nuclear facility. The International Atomic Energy Agency arrived in Zaporizhia on Wednesday. It's assessing damage to the plant from repeated shelling. Today, the head of the IAEA shared preliminary findings at a press conference in Vienna. I was able to see uh, myself and, and my team uh, impact holes um, markings on, on buildings of um, uh, shelter. So it means that the physical integrity of the facility uh, has been violated not once, but several, uh, several times. A full report from the inspectors is expected by next week. NBC's Jay Gray has more from Ukraine. Hey there, a lot of new information coming out about the situation at the nuclear plant in Zafarisa. Let's start, though, with the bullet points, the new information we're getting right now. First of all, structural damage to the facility. It is a primary concern and something that's going to continue to be a concern. There have been reports that inspectors were not being allowed into certain areas of the plant. We have heard today that's not the case, that they had free reign, that they could go and see what they asked to see there in the plant. There's also a big concern about what's going to happen outside of that plant as far as the continued and stepped up fighting in the region. Remember, that plant has to have electricity coming in as well to make sure that those reactors stay cooled. And so that's something that is a big concern for those that are monitoring the situation. Six inspectors still inside the facility right now and will be for the next uh, couple of days anyway. But two will remain full time. We know that there's been a deal struck between the agency and uh, the Ukraine government as well as the Russian government to allow two to stay. So that's good news as far uh, as far as assessing future risk. We should also point out uh, that there is, uh, according to those who have been inside, that uneasy tension between uh, the Russian soldiers who remain inside and the Ukrainians who continue to operate the plant. Uh, they say it is a concern, but that right now both sides are acting professionally and keeping things going there. That's the latest here in Ukraine. I'm Jay Gray. Back to you. In Argentina, schools and businesses were closed today. Its vice president survived what appears to be a failed assassination attempt. Crowds gathered outside the presidential palace in Buenos Aires in support of Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner. Yesterday, she was part of a frightening scene outside her home in Buenos Aires. It happened as the VP walked by a crowd of people. Take a look at the video. A man jumped forward, pointed a gun in her face, and seemed to pull the trigger. Now, no bullets came out. You see it here from another angle. There's the gun. She was not hurt. Argentina's president says the gun had five bullets in it, but it failed to fire. The suspect's a 35-year-old Brazilian man living in Argentina. He has been arrested. Authorities have not mentioned a motive or said whether he acted alone. Vice President Kirchner has been involved in an ongoing corruption trial. The charges date back to her time as president from 2007 to 2015, and she faces up to 12 years in prison if convicted. Jane Fonda says she is beginning a fight against cancer. Today, the 84-year-old activist and Oscar winner revealed that she's been diagnosed with non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Fonda says she's already started chemotherapy. A post on her Instagram account reads, quote, this is a very treatable cancer. 80% of people survive, so I feel very lucky, unquote. Jane Fonda also says she will not let her treatment stop her political activism. NASA will try again to get back to the moon. But how likely is tomorrow's planned launch for the Artemis mission? We'll get into that just ahead. Stay close.
NASA will try again tomorrow to launch its Artemis 1 mission. The launch was originally slated for this past Monday. Crews scrubbed it because of a faulty temperature sensor. If tomorrow's launch is successful, it would be the maiden voyage for NASA's SLS rocket and Orion crew capsule. The mission will take the spacecraft into a lunar orbit and back over the course of 37 days. NBC Aviation correspondent Tom Costello has more from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Yeah, NASA now believes there is about a 60 to 80 percent chance that the weather will cooperate and they will be able to launch during a two hour window from the Kennedy Space Center on that historic launch pad 39B. As you know, they tried to lift off on Monday. They had to scrub just a few minutes into the launch window because they thought they had a problem with one of four engines. In fact, the number three engine. They've spent several days troubleshooting that issue. They now believe the engine is fine, that it was cooling properly, but they have a bad sense sensor giving them inaccurate data. So they've decided they're going to go ahead, give this launch attempt a try. Liftoff uh, starts, the window starts at 2.17 p.m. Eastern time. Again, it's a two hour window. They expect the weather should get better as the window proceeds. Now, if they can't lift off on Saturday, the next opportunity would be Monday and then Tuesday. After that, it would be mid-September. Clearly, they'd like to, like to get Artemis off the ground now and send it on its way towards an orbit around the moon, a 37-day orbit now around the moon since they've had to push this launch back. Again, an uncrewed mission paving the way for future crewed missions to the moon. Back to you. The U.S. economy is continuing to add jobs. According to the latest jobs report out today, the nation added 315,000 last month. And that's about what experts predicted. Economists polled by Dow Jones estimated about 318,000 jobs. But that's far fewer than we added in July. The economy added 528,000 jobs then. Experts had predicted that the unemployment rate would remain steady. It had been 3.5% in July. It rose slightly to 3.7%. The Dow Jones closed down more than 330 points today. It's the third straight week of declines. Let's get into and behind all these numbers with Caleb Silver, editor-in-chief of Investopedia. Good to see you tonight, and I wonder if we could start with what kinds of jobs were being added and what that tells us about how the economy is doing. Yeah, good to be with you as always. And when you look at the gains, they were pretty strong in higher paying jobs. Uh, we're looking at professional and business services up 68,000, healthcare up 48.2 thousand, retail 44. We'd seen layoffs there, big gains there, and leisure and hospitality. They've been adding jobs in leisure and hospitality for the past 16 months. That's where the strength was. We didn't see a lot of strength, though, in warehousing and in education. And there's a big problem because there's not enough teachers out there. It's very hard to keep them on the payrolls. So with higher paying jobs seeing the greatest increases, what does that tell us, if we can extrapolate from that, about how people are doing at different income levels? Does that mean that the, the lower down you are on the income ladder, the more you're struggling to find work or to keep jobs? What does that tell us uh, income bracket wise? Well, great question, but we've seen wage gains, but mostly with those lower income jobs, leisure and hospitality, hotel workers, some trucking, some warehousing, but now we're seeing some higher paying jobs and a lot of competition to retain workers, to, uh, to try to bring new workers onto your payrolls, and a lot of job hopping. We had the JOLTS report earlier this week. That's the, uh, jo the job openings and labor turnover survey, 11.4 million job openings, two job openings for every available worker. So there's plenty of jobs out there, and we're seeing a lot of people hop from job to job for better pay and better benefits. So we saw an employment rise, but also the U.S. economy added 786,000 people to the labor force. And some economists have been saying that that slight increase in unemployment is a good thing. What, what does that mean? Why, why are they saying that? It's a good question because the uh, payrolls gain is measured differently than the unemployment rate, which is a household survey. That surveys whether you were out looking for work, how many people in your household were out looking for a job. And a lot of people were out looking for a job in the past month, which makes that unemployment rate go up, but also the labor force participation rate. We want to see how many working adults or who could be working are actually in the workforce. That went up too. That's at its highest level all year. So more people jumping back in and a lot of older workers jumping back in, Joshua, maybe because inflation has eaten away at their savings, maybe because they want to make some extra money right now, but older workers are back in the workforce. 
So the jobs market is pretty wild right now. It's pretty hot. And I've seen, there was a piece in the Wall Street Journal this week about how so many businesses, having recovered these 22 million jobs from COVID, now have the task of trying to train all these workers, right? So productivity is not the same, and you've got you know, newer workers who aren't as productive as the veterans, and the veterans are having to train the newbies, and so it's just a weird time right now for the job market. How does the employment picture factor into all of the craziness we're seeing in the employment market right now? Yeah, look at where the gains were. They were in professional and business services. Those are your accountants. Those are your professional workers and offices. They need to be trained. They need to be retained. And that's very hard. We have a lot of turnover now in a lot of corporate jobs. So you're seeing that happen. But you're also seeing a lot of people, again, hop job to job looking for the better pay, the better benefits, the more flexibility as some companies are mandating people come back to the office. Some folks are looking for those jobs where people really don't care if you're in the office or not. That's got to be a bit of a worry. We're going to talk about returning to the office in just a second. But before I got to let you go, that's got to be a bit of a concern, right? Because training people costs money. It costs time, which costs money. And if people are hopping from job to job to job to job to job, companies are spending more money to train more people who don't stay as long. Is there any sense of when all of this might level out? No, because we're entering into some economic downturn here if we haven't already. So if we get into a recession or if we're already in one, that's not going to level out for a while because then you're going to start to hear about cutbacks and hiring freezes. You're hearing them on the fringes in tech and in retail and in some of the automakers, but you're going to hear that a little bit more broadly. When you start to hear the hiring freezes and then the struggle to retain workers, that, put company, that puts companies in a very difficult position as wages have been rising all along. So they have wage inflation, they have goods inflation, product inflation, and now they're they're dealing with trying to retain employees in a hot job market. Caleb Silver, Editor-in-Chief of Investopedia, always good to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So with those jobs numbers in mind, new hires are entering some rapidly shifting workplaces, as Caleb mentioned. But the shift also involves a debate that's getting very tense in some companies. Who should return to the office, how many days a week, and why? Many companies are mapping that out as we speak. On Monday, Apple could start requiring at least three days a week in its offices, not the retail stores, the corporate offices. But after more than two years of remote work, some employees are pushing back. They're asking for more flexibility and freedom. A few Apple employees spoke to NBC's Steve Patterson. There's a labor resistance brewing in the core of Apple. On Monday, the company is expected to begin enforcing a new return to office policy for its corporate workers in the San Francisco Bay Area, at least three days a week in the office. That's according to a memo sent up by CEO Tim Cook, which NBC News obtained and was first reported by Bloomberg. The memo said other offices would hear more details shortly. Apple making headlines for the move. When companies like Apple say something, there's no doubt that they have an outsized sort of influence on the narrative. But Apple now facing pushback, at least a thousand people signing a petition under a group of organized employees called Apple Together, demanding more flexible work. It's unclear how many signatures are from retail versus corporate employees. We're arguing for flexibility. Stephen McGrath, a software developer who worked for Apple in the 90s and returned four and a half years ago, says he signed the petition because he's worried about the company's values. I love Apple as a company, but I'm not enthralled with the policies. And there's been this dissonance between what senior management says and what the rest of the people of Apple are saying to each other. Well, are you considering leaving the company entirely because of this? I will say that in the immediate future, because of the situation with COVID, and because, as you can tell, I'm not the youngest person at Apple, the risk is just too high. Apple did not reply to NBC's request for comment. Some experts say corporate leaders may refuse to budge on return to office policies. I am hearing directly from CEOs and major company CHROs that they're going to stick to it. Given that we're slightly in a recession right now, you can find out who are your loyal workers by having this screening mechanism of, say, it's time to return to the mothership. And those who don't, uh, this will allow them to shrink their firms a little through voluntary separations versus firing people. Beyond layoff fears, some experts note that a majority of workers, particularly younger ones, actually want some face-to-face -face work time. When we survey employees aged 20 to 29, 
only 24% want to work fully remote. The reason is they want to get the benefits of mentoring. Still, some full-time remote workers have grown used to the flexibility of working from home. According to a June Gallup survey of more than 8,000 workers, the desire to work exclusively from home more than doubled since October 2021. For the work from home revolution to persist, we, it, it needs to be the case that workers are both productive at home and the firm can verify this productivity. And for Apple loyalists like Steven, he says working from home is worth fighting for. Even if I don't get what I personally want, I care about the people who are doing the right things. I care about my colleagues. That was NBC's Steve Patterson reporting. Thank you for making time for us. Safe travels if you're heading out this Labor Day weekend. I would love to know your thoughts on this story about returning to the office or if you are watching the ongoing drama at Mar-a-Lago or watching Serena Williams play. We'd love to hear from you on this or anything we discussed tonight. We're at NBC Now Tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. You can leave us a brief but brilliant voicemail, 888-575-2NBC. That's 888-575-2622, or email us now tonight at NBCnews.com. So until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Enjoy the end of summer, and we will see you on Monday. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.